Hello, I am Andrew Gibson, also known as Adventures in 9 on YouTube, and this presentation is about making a port of 9front to MIPS. Um, my original motivation um, was to use 9front to set up some home automation and Internet of Things uh, type devices. I started off using Miller's port of Plan 9 for the Raspberry Pi um, before moving over to 9front. Uh, I made some drivers for some I2C devices like um, temperature, humidity, CO2, ambient light, and uh, also did a file system to control whiz based uh, smart light bulbs. Um, the Plan 9 way of networking uh, devices sort of solves like most of the issues that plague uh, Internet of Things products. Um, so you can have your own local authentication server, so that means you can regulate who can access your devices. Um, and you don't have to worry about keeping your credentials on some remote server or your device is not working if the internet goes out. Um, Ninefront in particular uses TLS to encrypt traffic. Um, so that adds another layer of security. Um, one of the reasons I was able to do like, you know, a driver for those whiz light bulbs is because uh, they send all their data in the clear and other people already snooped on it and left notes on, you know, what commands to send to the light bulbs. Um, diskless booting has been part of uh, plan 9 since the beginning so um, these devices tend to have like very limited amount of local storage so that means um, they can be easily set up to just boot off a file server um, and you know everything you know plan 9 tends to have the concept of everything shares a file server so again these devices have very little local storage um, they could be easily configured to just use your file server um, or they could you know, show up on the file server as a file, which means they can just be read and copied to disk. Um, so there's a whole package, you know, something like Ninefront provides, you know, authentication, encrypted access, remote configuration, and storage of collected data, along with the assumption that everything's going to, you know, be accessed as plain text from a file. Um, this makes it trivial to set up scripts to, you know, read an ambient light sensor and change the brightness of a light bulb or, you know, record the temperature and CO2 levels throughout the day and make a chart. Um, so basically this is just, you know, sort of stuff Plan 9 already does. Um, it's just in a new context, uh, sort of repurposing the concept of a CPU server. So rather than being something that, you know, crunches numbers, um, it's basically, you know, small devices that will read sensor data or do something by, you know, flipping some GPIO pins or something. Um, so I started all this off by using a couple of Raspberry Pi 3Bs. Um, and when I wanted to get something more elaborate, um, I wanted to use some little smaller Raspberry Pi Zeros, but by that point the global chip shortage had happened and um, Raspberry Pis either became impossible to find or they're crazy expensive. So I went looking for some alternatives and one of the ones I found was this thing called the Onion Omega 2. Um, and it bills itself as just basically being an IoT development kit. Um, the Onion Omega 2 comes with a MediaTek MT7688. Um, this was developed years ago for home Wi-Fi routers, so it comes with Wi-Fi. Um, the core of it is a MIPS 24K, or specifically a KEC, which means that it has no floating point unit, but instead adds a digital signal processor, which that's kind of an interesting choice. It runs at about 580 megahertz, um, and the one I got came with an added uh, 128 megabytes of RAM, so they don't have any RAM on the package. It's a separate thing. Um, so like I said, since it's designed for Wi-Fi routers, it comes with Wi-Fi. It also has GPIO pins, and on most routers, that's for things like your reset switches and your blinking lights. Uh, has I squared C, UART, SPI, um, and uh, also has USB and can read SD cards. So it actually can do quite a bit of stuff there. Um, along with that, later on, I also purchased one of these things. Same MediaTek chip. It's just packaged up as an actual router, so it has like five... Uh, Ethernet ports on the side there. It comes with a little antenna and all that. And it's from this outfit called Highlink. Again, very reasonably priced, was in stock. Um, and the nice thing about developing on this was that the um, the U-boot that came pre-installed with it would talk through the Ethernet. Um, so this allowed me to just, um, you know, 
when I was testing kernels to just pull them down off the uh, off my file server using TFTP. Um, so I'd known that you know um, Plan Nine and Nine Front had MIPS compilers, and that Plan Nine had ran on MIPS systems in the past. Um, so basically, after that, it was you know time to dig through the archives. Um, and what I found actually. was this thing, this RB kernel in the uh, old legacy plan nine code. And this was written for a, a Theros based MIPS 24K processor, another router board. Um, but I quickly figured out that like plan nine and nine front had diverged quite a bit over the years over how things were kind of handled in the background and uh, it was kind of a pain to try and get this one to compile um, with nine fronts portable code. Um, so digging around in um, nine front, I found that they had a kernel for an old SGI indie, you know, so one of the Silicon graphic workstations somebody had laying around, I guess. Um, also a MIPS based system. Um, and interestingly enough, this one also had borrowed from that RB kernel. So I figured it was fairly compatible and this one had managed to keep pace with the various changes that Ninefront had added. So I ended up using this one as sort of my template for building a kernel. Um, but uh, one of the nice things about the um, that RB kernel was they had left some notes behind um about some interesting issues so one of them was that the uh, the 24k kernels had an issue with cache writes that if you did too many in a row it would lose them um and the solution to that was just to throw sort of just throw a no op in so many writes to prevent that from happening and that they had um made a patch for the nine front it ended up being in the linker um, for the mips linker um, that you could set a flag so it would do that uh, just toss in no ops every so often. Um, and the other one was they mentioned that the um, uh, that you'd get a lot of TLB misses. Um, these routers only like this one in particular only had 16 TLB entries, so they're not designed to do a lot of stuff. So there wasn't a lot of space for handling your your memory management, um, and that it would throw a lot of TLB misses trying to step on its own toes. So that was something to keep an eye out for. Um, so other than that, I should give a shout out to the folks at NetBSD. Um, while Plan 9 and 9 Front had plenty of stuff to work with MIPS and even the MIPS 24K core, um, NetBSD had some notes um, for some things particular to the MediaTek MT7688. Um, so with all that back stuff, background stuff out of the way, um, time to dig into what it takes to get a functional uh, kernel for the MT7688. So the first thing was um, I tried to just sort of compile the MIPS environment, you know, the libraries and all that. Um, and since, you know, someone had obviously done one for MIPS back in the day, um, that worked. Um, and I was familiar with how to do this. I'd done this with the, you know, with ARM since I was, you know, doing my development on AMD 64 system and having to cross compile for ARM32 and ARM64 for the Raspberry Pi stuff. Um, MIPS comes in two flavors um, and they're big Indian and little Indian. So MIPS, anything with, you know, in a MIPS directory on, on plan nine and nine front um, is the big Indian MIPS. Um, the little Indian one's called SPIM, you know, MIPS backwards, S-P-I-M. So for the big Indian stuff, um, it would all work, it used the BC compiler. Um, and that was the big surprise because historically, you know, the original MIPS systems were almost all big Indian systems. Um, the um, little Indian compiler is called zero C, but it's actually, um, It's actually just a shell script that runs the BC compiler with this L flag to, you know, compile it little Indian. So it's the same compiler really. 
Um, but when running that through the spim stuff, it didn't work. Um, ended up getting all these errors. It would crash out. Um, that's basically because nobody had bothered to test any of this because there was no kernels for little Indian MIPS. Um, so what I had to pack to do was, well, one of them was like there was an error in Ape, which I didn't care about because I was just trying to get a kernel to build. So I did some ugly hacks at first just to get it to build without crashing out so it would finish building everything. Um, and then later on had to go back and fix things properly. Um, and well, my paper makes it sound a little bit more linear than it was because, yeah, I ended up having to jump back and forth a few times between making the kernel and fixing the actual system as a whole because um, there was some definitely some dusty spots in the code there. Um, but anyway, on to actually building the kernel. Um, so I ended up borrowing basically the low-level stuff from the RB kernel. And part of that is for that cache issue. Um, they'd made sure to put in no ops periodically, you know, manually just put them in to make sure there wasn't, you know, too many consecutive cache writes. Um, the other thing was, was that um, the MIPS 24K core added a, uh, a special wait instruction to use when you're idling. And this was sort of a, a, like a power saving feature. You know, again, these are designed for little, you know, home routers, um, you know, in little plastic cases. So they need to be power efficient, low heat, um, and so I use that too. Um, for most of the higher level stuff, like the syst calls and the trap code, I pulled that from SGI because that mostly had been kept pace with what Ninefront had changed over the years. So um, did that. Um, the MediaTek chip had a um, it's like a one sixty five fifty compatible UART which is close enough to an 8250. So I ended up borrowing um, an 8250 driver from one of the nine front uh, ARM kernels. Um, and then the other thing I needed to just basically boot was a little bit of code for the clock and to handle the clock interrupt. So I needed to be able to catch the clock interrupt and that would be used to, um, to call the scheduler to move things along. So there wasn't a lot needed to actually just get it to basically boot. And, uh, once I had those, you know, combination of stuff from the SGI and the RB kernels, um, got it to compile, loaded it into U-boot, and um, surprisingly, it was, well, with surprising little effort anyway, um, it worked, like, pretty quick. So it would, um, you know, get through the basic sort of configuration stuff, you know, in, in L.S, this first boot up routine, um, make the jump to main, um, so I would call the main function, you know, most of the main function stuff, there's only a couple things that are actually particular to the chip. A lot of that's the stuff's actually calling sort of, um, portable code called a scheduler. Um, the scheduler would then also come back and call this init zero function. It would make it all the way through here. Um, and then make this last sort of jump to user space and then it would die. So not bad for like just sort of slapping stuff together. Um, what it would die on was not very helpful though. So what it would do originally was it would just say panaboot process died and no error message. And for a couple weeks I was kind of stuck there. Um, what I ended up having to do was add a bunch of like um, dump reg and dump stacks and stuff in there. Um, and as you can see, I was able to trying to find what's the last thing it was doing before dying, and it was making this syscall to open. So having already seen a few like Indian bugs by going through and cleaning up the code, um, you know, trying to get the the, the spim system to to build as a whole. I was had a hunch it would kind of be a Indian issue, and it kind of was, but not really. Um, this ended up being like a rather odd one. Um, and I was able to actually, what helps out was um, I'd found that there was one other spim kernel that had been done, and that was for this Luangsun chip in the Legacy 9 code. 
um, long since this Chinese outfit, they'd um, gotten a MIPS license and made some chips based on MIPS, and they happened to be using them Little Indian. And there was a note in here, basically somewhere in the syscall code, that said there was a difference between the MIPS and the SPIM libc. Um, and that turned out, let's see. So what would happen is that like the MIPS stuff would, you know, has the syscall, but SPIM would add four and take it away later. Um, and that's like four bytes, so it's one word. Um, now in the, you know, the MIPS code, when it would do a syscall, it would go ahead and shift everything over by one word. Um, and in the Luang Sun kernel, they didn't bother, but they just left a note saying, by the way, they're different. I never found any documentation on why they're different. And rather than change libc, I decided to do what the Luang Sun kernel was and basically go through the anything with a syscall and remove, you know, where it would try to shift it over by one word. Um, and once I did that, that solved that problem. Um, my next one was, was that it would, so this is all happening here in init C. So it would originally die here at this open syscall. Next, it would die at this bind. Um, and when I looked into why this bind call was dying, at this point, system calls in, in general were working. Um, Bind didn't work because the arguments being passed to it, so in this case, you know, you see dev, env, env, you know, it's these here. Um, these were getting like chopped off, like they're getting truncated. Um, now this whole time I'd already noticed that like there was text getting garbled, you know, for quite a while, you know, I had the issue where it was, you know, saying, you know, instead of panic boot, it was saying panic boot. Um, and the notes for the RB kernel had mentioned that the UART on that old Atheros chip had kind of a flaky UART on it. You know, they put a flaky one on there to save a buck, I guess. I figured maybe that's what's happening here until now I've realized um, that text is getting garbled, not just going down the UART, but internally in the system. So going through everything having to do with all the processes of passing an argument down bind, um, that ended up leading through Sterlin to this bit of machine specific code in libc called Sterchar. And what was happening here was there's a bit, you know, this is where Sterlin would try to see, you know, if, you know, you'd come across a null character because that would be the end of the string. So you could determine the string length. And it was using this to do that. Well, this was checking the word each character, each byte in the word backwards because it was set up originally um, in a big Indian configuration. So I fixed that and um, not only did that solve that problem of bind not working, but it also ungarbled all the text coming down the UART. So it ended up working fine after that. Um, after that was, um, oh, I had some just goofy bug that was kind of my fault. Um, the um, the code I'd copied for the RB kernel, that chip had 16 TLB entries. The MT7680 had 32, um, and basically would try to actually load and run PACFS, and then the memory management unit would would uh, die. So all I had to do was change, you know, a macro somewhere to 32, um, and then that functioned. And then after this, I basically um, was just the fact that I hadn't, I'd only been using the UART in the most primitive sense. I just wanted to be able to get error messages out of it. So, you know, I was just spamming characters directly into the transmit register. Um, at this point now, it would boot up all the way, get to the boot prompt and ask what to do next. And I couldn't type anything in. Um, so for that, I had to actually go and get the... Um, uh, the interrupt handling done. So like I mentioned before, the MIPS core came, comes with seven interrupts on it. 
two of those, the first two, zero and one, are software interrupts, which it seems like no one actually uses. So most stuff calls the second interrupt interrupt zero, and that's your first hardware interrupt. Um, now this thing obviously has more than like five devices on it. So MediaTek added a secondary interrupt controller that the UART and most of the other things were hooked to. This interrupt controller could do both high and low priority interrupts. So that took up interrupt two and three. Um, and so, yeah, I had to basically write, you know, the interrupt controller code for the MIPS and then a second one that would be called for the other one. And I had to keep this all lined up because, you know, really my first interrupt was interrupt two. Um, and then all the other interrupts on the secondary interrupt controllers were offset off that, but they had their own internal numbers. Um, so, yeah, basically this, uh, you know, led to a lot of sort of uh, weird bugs because it was lots of places where I could easily mess up getting the alignment. And so either I'd get a lot of, you know, spam messages about unhandled interrupts or the UART didn't work. Eventually got that working though. Um, and so with the interrupt handling code done, um, I was able to actually get it to boot. Um, and with nine front, they had a feature where you can type like, um, you know, bang RC at the uh, boot prompt and this would just fire up RC and just let you play with whatever came on the PACFS file system that comes with the kernel. Um, uh, but 9 front isn't, or plan 9 in general isn't very interesting without a network. You know, by itself it's kind of boring. So the next thing was to do a Ethernet driver. So the Ethernet driver for this wasn't all that interesting. I mean it behaves, the Ethernet driver itself sort of behaves like an Ethernet driver. Um, kind of the only interesting aspects to it. Let's see here. Um, there's one particular one for um, MIPS related stuff and that has to do with how MIPS handles memory. Oops. Um, let's see here. So on a MIPS system, um, the way the memory is mapped, case egg zero, which is most of your kernel stuff is happens in, um, and a lot of your um, you know, your access to the registers for IO and stuff for your devices are mapped there too. Um, but there's another section a little higher up called case egg one. It matches exactly what's in case egg zero, except the address is just shifted and it's uncached. So um, what I ended up doing was that I already use a macro for most of the stuff whenever I'm trying to do IO to you know, the UART or anything else that uses the uncached address. So I don't have to bother flushing caches. Um, and in this case, when I made a, the um, descriptor rings for the transmit and receive descriptors, you know, I used X span alloc to get a contiguous space in memory, set it up for the descriptors, and then made a thing to shift them all up into the uncached memory um, and then would access them from there. So that way I didn't have to manually do, you know, cache flushing operations every time I wanted to, you know, go through the ring. Um, and the other thing about this is obviously this is a, um, you know, this thing's set up to be like a home Wi-Fi router. On the MT7688, there is one Ethernet Mac and it is wired directly into a seven port Ethernet switch, which handles all the physical end of stuff. Um, so port six is what the, um, the ethernet is wired into port five wasn't wired into anything. It's for some other feature that a manufacturer might want to add. And then ports zero through four were the external ports, um, especially on that, um, high link router board and port zero is typically the, the WAN port. So, um, Again, this is somewhere where NetBSD came in handy. They had some notes on how to just set up the switch to just act as a basic unmanaged switch. So basically ports one through four along with the internal uh, ethernet could all be wired together into an unmanaged switch. And with all that, 
Um, I was able to actually get the whole thing to boot, um, connect to the auth server, my file server, and um, basically just work as any other computer on my grid. And here it is here. So, So there's the memory. Here's a little message that gives it boot. So, you know, the little MIPS core here. Got 32 TLB entries. Oops. Um, yep. Here's a, some stuff on the uh, information on the one Ethernet device in it. Um. And here's actually where my talk's going to kind of diverge from what I had on my paper. So by the time I'd written that, I decided to go back, you know, after writing it and um, um, went through and got the floating point unit working. So originally it only halfway worked. So things like, the, you know, these charts on stats wouldn't draw, you know, the numbers would come up, but there'd be no, no bars. The clock would have just one hand that started in the center and went off to infinity. The second hand wouldn't draw, none of the dots. Um, so I went back through and found some last little, you know, Indian issues um, and got those fixed. So um, one of the other ones I think was that the uh, was cat clock wouldn't work. So it would draw the, the background of the cat, the body of it, because that's just a bitmap. But the eyes, the tail, and the hands on the clock wouldn't draw. So got all that working. Um, and then the other thing was, is I managed to get my hands on another router board, another MIPS board, and it's this bugger here. And it runs this, uh, so Qualcomm ended up, I guess, buying Atheros at some point. So this is the QCA9531. It's another Atheros based chip. So it's a lot like the, uh, the RB kernel. It only took me a couple weeks to basically tweak mine to look more like that old RB kernel again and uh, get this board to work. Um, and so this one does have that same problem the other one had. So on this one here, like, you know, the, uh, the TLB misses do jump up quite a bit, but if nothing's going on, they'll kind of go back down. Um, See, but on the uh, other one here, they're just pretty much pegged out all the time. So another thing about this is uh, so yeah, you can see here, it's still a MIPS 24K, runs a little faster, less TLB entries. Um, this one, however, comes with two Ethernet Macs. Let's see, where is that? Here's one. So there's, a, you know, there's Ether 0 and Ether 1. Um, so it's a little slightly different from the other one. And yeah, this is a, um, a big Indian chip. So now there's both big Indian and little Indian um, MIPS kernels running. The, um, the MT7688 one um, got it done enough that it's actually in um, uh, the main nine front repository now um, that QCA 9531 I have that one up on my github page it's uh, a little rougher um, so as for future stuff um, these both kind of have a, a common thing and that's um, you know plan 9 has a way to interact with Ethernet devices as file systems um, nine front added a virtual bridge device um, that handles VLANs and stuff. Um, but there's nothing really, there's no portable standard driver to handle switching hardware. And these little switches, you know, this little MT7688 has a surprising number of features. Um, it can both do per port VLANs, VLAN untagging at the port. Um, it can set priorities on those VLANs for things like voice over IP phones and stuff. Um, it can detect 
uh, react to and throw an interrupt for broadcast storms. It'll also throw interrupts if a port gets plugged or unplugged. Um, so yeah, some sort of future things to keep in mind is trying to design a um, you know a switch device and file system um, that will play nice with the existing um, bridge device um, for handling VLANs and stuff. So that's going to take some some kind of thought to get that done. Um, other than that, most of everything else on these chips is pretty standard things. There's already, you know, code out there to do things like I2C, you know, the UART, uh, stuff like that. Um, you know, the Wi-Fi driver will have to be done, but um, 9 front at least already has um, a fair amount of background portable code for doing Wi-Fi stuff. Um, but the uh, the only other thing is that, like, kind of the, the, the specter that haunts anything about MIPS is that... Um, you know, the company that owns the MIPS intellectual property has announced that they're moving all their new designs to RISC-V and that they're going all in on doing AI stuff. Um, the other big company in MIPS is Long Sun, um, and they've announced that they're moving from MIPS to their own kind of homebrew ISA. Um, and it's MIPS-like, but it's not one-to-one -one compatible, so it's, it, it is its own thing. Um, there's one other company called Ingenic, which um, still makes MIPS cores and uses them for a lot of IoT devices and stuff. Um, but even though MIPS isn't like developing any new stuff, um, there's a lot of old stuff still in production, still out there. Um, so like that, uh, that Atheros board that I purchased, um, there's actually quite a few boards that have this sort of design. Uh, it seems to be a common one out of China where it comes with a mini PCI slot that are typically fitted with a, like a mobile data card. And then they'll have this thing here is actually a SIM card holder. So I guess a common uh, use case for these is sort of like a home um, mobile data access point. Um, so if anything we've learned from the recent chip shortage is that a lot of manufacturers are going back to old designs that are still available and saying these are good enough. Um, you know, and these sort of embedded systems tend to have a long tail anyway. So even though, you know, MIPS isn't like, you know, is kind of a dead man walking at this point. There's still a lot of chips out there, a lot of stuff being made. Um, and yeah, they're cheap and available. Um, and for something like if you wanted to get on, you know, on board with doing a, um, you know, an Ethernet switch, you know, file system interface, um, these are definitely a cheap test bed for that. Um, there's another MediaTek chip, the MT7621, which is a little nicer. It's um, actually, it's a dual core, dual thread thing. So on Linux systems, it actually shows up as a quad core processor. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the Wi-Fi routers I have in my house, I purchased, you know, at the store down the street. And uh, when I looked into them, they're actually those MediaTek MT7621s in them. So they're, you know, still being, they're still on the store shelves. Um, but yeah, so fun little uh, project. Um, got to dig into some of the dustier corners of Plan 9 and 9 Front and clean out some cobwebs there. Um, so almost forgot one last little bit of thing. Um, when I was writing the paper, there's one other sort of bug. I originally wrote my first draft. Um, that later I went back through, I'm like, this doesn't seem right, and I pulled it, so it didn't end up in the paper, and I ended up actually finding the uh, the real culprit. So part of the problem when I was building the um, building the SPIM system was one of the ones that caused me a lot of grief for a while was um, both in APE and in LibC, there was an issue with the test and set function. So it would just be underscore TAS. Um, it would just say it wasn't there. Um, I came up with like a kind of an ugly hack to make it work and that was to you know I figured like well this is where it should be um, and so I just put in you know text TAS and it would just fall through to run this test and set function so I already knew that like the um, um, you know the uh, MT7688 and actually looking through the uh, the MIPS 24K um, manuals said that it had the um, uh, oops the 
load link and um, store conditional uh, commands are there. And the, uh, the code I borrowed from the RB kernel added them to. Um, and so I knew that like, well, if I wanted to do this, I, you know, I'm going to use this one because it includes them. Um, and I noticed that the, uh, the legacy plan nine code had done a similar thing too. Um, but digging through the code to find out, well, why is it doing this? And it turns out that, well, MIPS, the MIPS code does have that function. Um, and what it does is it's supposed to check for what kind of MIPS system you're running and, and run the, the proper, you know, test and set routine. Um, but what ended up happening with the spim one was that, you know, unless something was specifically a little Indian issue, the spim code mostly just copied code over from the MIPS directory. When building the system, um, there would be some portable code that would check the machine specific directory. If it was lacking a file, it would try to build a portable one instead. Then later on, you know, make would get down to the spim directory. The spim directory would say, hey, copy this stuff over from MIPS and try to compile it. And in that whole process, there'd be some crazy unpredictable errors. Um, so at first I was like, well, you know, I was thinking like, there's just something wrong. They forgot to put this in, it ended up it was in there, you know, so there was actually the test and set function, you know, for MIPS it would work, um, you know, it would, pick one of these two sort of, uh, you know, the old 3K or the newer 4K. Um, my solution to this was figuring that like, um, you know, there probably wasn't any, you know, old little Indian MIPS systems in existence. So uh, my solution was just to use the newer um, 4K style test and set with LL and SC and just call that Taz, um, put that into spims libc, and then that way when it would build, it would pull in, you know, most of the uh, um, the portable code, and then just use that. So something to keep out, keep an eye out for, I guess, um, when building these sort of things. Um, that uh, yeah, so that ended up being kind of a, an interesting fluke where it was like, it looked like it would be set up right, but when it actually tried to run, um, it ended up causing some some strange strange errors for sure. Um, so yeah. Um, and in the meantime, uh, have fun. <laughs>